we've talked some on Google Plus, and I've, I've, I've wanted to kind of meet you in real life ish and uh, and see what's going on with you and um, have you tell us a little bit about yourself first. Okay, uh, my name is Daniel Pritchett. I live in Memphis. Been here since 2005 or so. I'm a developer, currently working for a company called Fred's doing business intelligence development. We've got six, seven hundred retail stores and we bring in data from the retail stores into a big mainframe and my job is to take some data out of that into a larger data warehouse and then build reports off of it. So there's a lot of different steps involved. Um, I mostly do the data architecture, but more fun to me, I guess, is all the scripting I do at the margins in Python and Ruby and JavaScript. So as far as tech goes, that's the sort of thing that really gets me excited to talk about. Yeah. So it's a, I mean, obviously all the developers here agree with this, but you've got to learn more than just the one thing you do most, you know, you end up doing a lot of everything, I guess. Right. Um, so, Daniel, uh, you before you were at Fred's, you went to um, you went to the University of Alabama. So you are our uh, our rival here in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, I suppose. Yes. But congr have... congratulations are in order for your national championship. So hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> when I was in school, we didn't have any get anywhere close to that. It's pretty neat now, though. It is. It is a good. It was a a good game, and for you guys at least, not for LSU. But um, I, I'm not a big sports guy, so I won't get too much into that. Uh, so, <laughs> Daniel, how uh, what brought you over to Memphis originally? Um, well, I was coming out of grad school, and my wife Chandler was looking for a master's program in fine arts to study painting, and she wound up entering the MFA program at the University of Memphis. And I asked a professor if he knew of any job openings or alumni connections in Memphis. And he found somebody working at International Paper, which is a Fortune 100 company in the area. And that guy had been through the same MIS undergrad program I went through. I never met him, but I did wind up meeting him, and he got me connected with people at International Paper. And I worked there about five years. Okay, cool. Yeah, so were you doing similar kind of stuff at International Paper? Yep, it was uh, business intelligence there, but we used an SAP system, and our BW team had 20 or 30 people, so we had fairly narrowly defined roles, but now at Fred's, the BW team has one person, and I get to put my hands on a lot of different things, and that's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So, what are the big challenges in development and designing of, of these big data structures like this? Because, you know, I mean, I'm, I work... And some of these guys may work with that stuff, but I work with smaller stuff as in websites, individual site data gathering, which is nothing mm -hmm. compared to big data. So what are, what are the unique challenges to that? Well, I think the biggest challenges are usually put uh, come out, spring up out of your budgetary concerns. Say if you've got international papers, probably easier to use, for example. So we had a bunch of factories that were printing out for creating paper and cardboard boxes all day. So we're running, say, 100 paper machines for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that generates a lot of data that's all logged to this transactional system. But then from a business warehouse perspective, you have people who want to do more broad-reaching strategic reports on that. So they want to say, of our 100 paper machines, which ones are being more efficient than average or less efficient than average? And so you can imagine how you do a single report on that where you go out and pull all your data for each machine and then do some calculations and come up with a sorted report. But the idea behind business intelligence reporting is that you come up with a bunch of different possible reporting elements and import it all and pre-calculate it on a regular basis. So they're generating gigabytes worth of data every day and then overnight we have to bring it in and compact it into a pre-aggregated format. So we'll summarize and multiply out certain things so that when somebody decides, oh, I want to see uh, performance in District 7 by these people on Tuesdays for the last six months. They can run their report in 20 seconds rather than all day. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's just a, it's, it almost seems like an amazing feat, but big data has become a huge um, piece of the industry, and I know that every major manufacturing company is looking at how to expand it and use it to increase efficiency and logistics and everything else. Um, I saw something that I wanted to talk to you about, I think it was yesterday, uh, a guy had posted, a journalist had posted something about um, the top search results um, for, I guess, where the top search results for the term big data came from. 
Mm -hmm. and the biggest one was India. Do you have any thoughts on why that may be, or, or what you know that says to you? So big data has say Google Trends. More people are following that topic in India. Yep, than anywhere else. Hmm. I, I, it, it was just something out of left field that I saw that I was wondering if you had any insight into. I know there's a lot of offshoring groups that apply for available contracting jobs, and maybe it's a, a major keyword that's being put into a lot of offshoring companies when they're setting up uh, proposals for different things, but right. I can't imagine that big data is something that you'd want to outsource right off the bat, at least not at that level. Right. I, I, I think that was interesting, too, because, yeah, I think that you would, you would assume people would start here doing it before mm -hmm. they, they move that kind of thing offshore. But anyway, um, so along those lines with business data, where, where do you kind of see it going down the line? I mean, we're getting more and more access to data. So what kind of big things do you see coming down the, in the future? Well, I think the biggest uh, is the move away from single big iron systems to more distributed stuff like Hadoop. And I'm posting a link to in the chat on the side to an article that I really like about Yahoo and the, the history of Hadoop and how it applies to a lot of companies. There's a great example in there of eBay that started a, I want to say they started out with a couple of hundred machines in a Hadoop cluster just mm -hmm. as a, a trial basis and then within a year they increased it by a factor of five and now they claim it's a cornerstone of their business. Just the, the types of processes they can do and the, the data that they can harvest is something they can't give up. And I think that a lot of companies are still more focused on big iron. So the SAP system I used in my last job, it was somewhat distributed, but it wasn't really scalable to the same degree something on it built on, say, AWS might be, mm -hmm. Amazon Web Services. Right. And I think that that type of design is going to slowly branch out, or I guess spread out from just big internet companies like Yahoo and eBay out to every company. And there right. are plenty of service providers buying to become the company that helps other companies with smaller IT departments figure that stuff out. Yeah, I was, that was kind of the next topic I was going to bring up was cloud stuff, so that fits right kind of into this. Um, you know, what kind of innovations have you seen in the cloud um, area that, that would help big businesses with lots of data like that? Are there, is, there a, is there a chance of there being a solution that comes out that could help not just one business, but, you know, hundreds? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of software as a service startups out there that do this kind of work with people already. Uh, that type has always been one of my favorite examples. They did tracking of tweets and posts and comments all over the internet. So a couple of years ago, you could register your account on Discuss and Intelligent Debate and Twitter and stuff, and it would track every post you made, and somebody could go to a central location to see what you were doing. And uh, so that type of thing is kind of a specialized, consumer-focused uh, startup. But there are other companies doing things like that. There's some white combinator companies. I think uh, Mixpanel is one where they set up ways for external sites to stream feeds of all the interaction on the website to Mixpanel. So I guess it's similar to Google Analytics, except designed to be more flexible, and you can do more stuff on the back end. You just send them the data, and they'll uh, track it for you and give you reporting options. So that is what is easiest for companies to get into now. But I think long term, uh, this tweet I just shared from the CTO at Amazon. Yesterday they released something called the Dynamo database. Mm -hmm. Now, Amazon's Dynamo technology, they put, put out a white paper on that years ago, and that inspired Hadoop at Yahoo. And Hadoop is something I've been personally interested in for a while. I've got books on it. I was okay. setting it up on Linux servers. But um, I didn't really ever have the time or the inclination to set up my own farm with multiple virtual machines that are all running the same image with the same Hadoop setup, and I just never quite had the energy to get into that. But now, with uh, this DynamoDB, plus another service Amazon offers called Elastic MapReduce, you can simulate this. You'll have your whole database stored. It's a distributed, scalable database on Amazon, and they charge you based on input and output and storage, that sort of thing. Okay. And then Elastic MapReduce is the data processing arm of a service like Hadoop. So given that you have this giant, scalable, responsive database, you want to, I don't know, maybe you tracked every 
click on your web page for the last two years, you want to see what happens at 3 or 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. So you could fire up a MapReduce job to go find every every record, discard it if it's not from Wednesdays, discard it if it's not from 3 or 7 p.m. and you've got your filter data set. That's a MapReduce job. Right. And you can save that back to your database and use it as the starting point for another more interesting query. So those yeah. two things combined to make a really accessible product for companies that maybe weren't ever going to get into setting up their own fleet of, say, 50 uh, Rackspace or Amazon cloud servers where someone's actually setting up Linux, setting up Hadoop, doing all that work. Right now, you can go to Amazon and just create a table and start building up your data and create a job to query it. Wow, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Um, so explain to me Hadoop, because I haven't actually looked into Hadoop before. Okay. Um, Hadoop is, well, it's kind of a suite of technologies that enable the type of computing we've been talking about. Um, it was created at Yahoo about uh, maybe five years ago. Um, the idea they had was they wanted to be able to have scalable computing with unstructured data. So for the unstructured data, they created something based off of Google's big table file store, which is something Google had put out white papers on. And the idea is you'll have, say on a regular computer, you might have a 200 gigabyte hard drive and a single partition. So you have uh, that one partition on a single drive. But with Hadoop, you have a logical drive. And maybe you want to have two petabytes, but you're going to split it across two gigabytes per server. So you have however many thousand servers that is. And you install Hadoop on each of those, and you set up HDFS, the Hadoop file system. And okay. then it handles all the work on the back end of stitching all those together and presenting it as a single file system. So that's the starting point, getting a lot of data on a commodity machine. And that's the big benefit of cloud computing is you don't necessarily need to have $10,000 servers. You can have a few dollars per week for a server and get as many as you need and scale it up and down. So with Hadoop, you've set up the HDFS. You put in as many machines as you need and start filling up the data. And then there's a whole ecosystem of uh, tools and products around Hadoop, but the two main components are a logical file system that can scale across multiple machines, and then from that you set up jobs. And MapReduce is a really important concept because you wind up being able to define a very small task and split it out to a lot of different job, uh, computers all at once. So maybe right. if you had one computer that was trying to go through two, two petabytes of data one line at a time, it might take a while. Yeah. So my favorite analogy for uh, how MapReduce works is something I read on Hacker News a while back. Uh, the idea was imagine you're in a big library and you've got a team of 10 people and someone's assigned you with the task of counting all the books. So each person gets a little notepad, and they'll go out, and you'll pick one bookshelf to yourself, and you'll count bookshelf by bookshelf. This shelf has 100 books. You'll write it down. This one has 200 books, and so on and so on. So each person writes down one number per shelf, and then maybe each person will wind up counting 50 shelves. So you've got 10 pieces of notepaper with 50 numbers on them, and then you add up each, on each page. You add up all those numbers to get one sum. Then you have 10 sums, and you add those up to get a single sum of all the books in the library based on those individual work units. Yeah. And that's the way MapReduce works. The map phase is splitting up a single job to be done on a single unit of work. So given a single bookshelf, your map job is count the books. And so now you've counted all these thousands of bookshelves, and then your reduce job is, given these thousand numbers, reduce them all into a single number with the plus operation. So you basically have this huge list of a thousand numbers, and you just go left to right, first number plus the second number, it gets you a sum, add that to the third number, and so on. So then you reduce that all the way up to a single number. Okay. So that's, that's MapReduce in a nutshell. That's really, that's really interesting. And I, you know, once again, because I'm not ever dealing with big data, I haven't read much about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, moving into a somewhat more, because you, you keep up with, like, social data, too, I know. You, you talked about it some in posts and stuff. Um, what, have you ever read any about... Um, opinion mining and different other creative ways to use social data uh, that's out there? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually working part-time on a little startup idea that is related to that. I can't really go too deep into detail, but okay. I can tell you about some other companies in that area and uh, what they do. 
like there's, uh, say, Radian 6, I think, is a sentiment monitoring company. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that you could set up MapReduce jobs to grab every tweet that's ever posted, which, by the way, is its own problem because yeah. you can't really just go out and do that yeah. in, in real time because Twitter won't let you. Right. And even if you had the infrastructure in place to support it, they'd rather charge you to do it. But so imagine you've worked out a deal with Twitter to get every tweet that's ever posted. You store that into, say, a big table file system, mm -hmm. and then you set up jobs to search for key terms. Maybe you've got a short list of a 1,000 marketable keywords you're interested in, like Super Bowl or child care or anything. And yeah. then within those, you use natural language processing to see, is this a positive comment or a negative comment? So it's fairly simplistic to say, given this large data set, peel out stuff that's relevant to a particular topic and yeah. then sort it into pro versus con. So that kind of thing works for opinion mining, but I'm sure well, there are. I, I think natural, I mean, uh, from what I've read about natural language processing, I, I I think on Twitter it might be relatively easy because you're limited to 140 characters. But when you talk about, like, if you want to look at, say, the blogosphere, just look at every blog you can mine, which is a lot if you've got some good people set up. Uh, yeah. You know, that's when it becomes, to me, a lot more difficult. Uh, how do you, you know, have you looked at that problem any, just out of curiosity? Well, uh, my first concern in that would be determining which blogs are real and which ones aren't. I mean, <laughs> search engine point. marketers... By trade, create huge blogs full of randomly generated content, and right. that right there would poison your data set <laughs> yeah. in that situation. Yeah. So you might have to have a whitelist yeah. of yeah. blogs that you actually care to read. But you could be doing something like, say, TechCrunch has thousands of articles. Maybe you want to check their whole back catalog and track trends over time. Right. Uh, that would actually pretty quickly get beyond my level of expertise in terms of language processing, because you could imagine a TechCrunch post might have, I don't know, along we might have a few thousand words, and that could be split into words or sentences or paragraphs, and you yeah. could do different types of analysis along each axis there. So yeah. I think that is, and I guess I hate to keep harping on uh, Hadoop type stuff, but if you have this data set, you can basically come up with one brilliant idea per day and say, okay, I've got all the TechCrunch data, and today I want to know what the keyword, the most popular keyword is in the second paragraph of a given article. And so you can keep coming up with reporting ideas and having a distributed, efficient reporting engine lets you go back and check it out. But for a product, if you wanted to sell the analysis across a large data set, then you kind of have to go back and forth there where you'd have a team of uh, internal product people coming up with meaningful queries we think might be valuable to our customers and just automatically doing them up front and selling the results, but then also you'd have to do endless customer development, asking the people who pay you, you know, what would be even more worth more than worthwhile to you, and what can we do to generate it for you? Yeah, oh, I mean it's definitely a big problem, but it's one of those ones that I could see uh, a lot of innovation happening in in the next few years on the internet, which I think will be it'll be fun to watch, and hopefully I'll, I'll get in somewhere that I get to be a part of some of it, I guess. Um, it, it, to shift focus a little bit before we kind of all open up the conversation, I want to ask you, um, you know, I guess today SOPA and PIPA were both kind of, well, SOPA is kind of declared quote-unquote dead, at least in its current form, and PIPA was put on, on hold. Um, what are your opinions on those two bills as well as any other, um, you know, kind of regulation of the Internet like that? Sorry, just uh, checking the chat window over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm generally not excited about them. Uh, they seem to be, to me, maybe too broadly, too broad reaching to not actually maybe solve the problems that they're reported to solve, but provide the government with extra powers that maybe it doesn't need to begin with. I mean, the mega upload case in the news today is a pretty nice, easy example. Uh, I mean, this is supposed to be one of the biggest offenders in the space, and yet the government's managed to take them out without dealing with SOPA and PIPA. And yeah. from what I understand, both of these uh, apps provide, where they kind of deny the uh, supposed offending site any kind of due process. Uh, if someone with any kind of uh, copyrights to their name decides that you, they have a plausible case for claiming your site is hosting their content, they submit a request and then 
from what I understand, the government just disables your DNS entries or redirects them to some landing page, and then your entire site goes offline. So I think the big problem to me is just the, the lack of due process uh, in taking a whole site offline based on one person's claim when that claim maybe doesn't have a high enough barrier in terms of due diligence. Like I'm not convinced that one companies uh, submitting claims would have to really prove what was going on before the site went down. And two, I don't, yeah, mostly I just don't trust the, yeah. the enforcement. I'd like, as a developer, I like to do yeah. small incremental changes. You throw out this giant, poorly specified program, it's going to have lots and lots of uh, unexpected consequences. But if you do one small thing at a time, it's a lot easier to keep track of what's going on. Right. Yeah, I know that's a funny way to look at it, but you're, you're right. And I... Um, I'm wondering, you know, there, I do think there is something that needs to be done about sites like Mega Upload being so easy to get to and so prominent um, on the Internet, because there are tons of them, torrent sites, all that stuff. And it is, when a company has a copyright on a, a product, I think, you know, people should pay for it. Uh, but I also think the recording industry needs to be making progressive movement towards, um, you know, offering their content in a way that people want to get it, which is right. online and streaming. So, you know, in that, like, perfect world um, imagination that we have, what would be your, you know, fix for that whole problem? Do you have a good idea about that? To fix? Well, I guess, to, you know, to, to appease both the, the people who create content and the people who um, want to get it at least for, you know, a decent price, a fair price. I have never really put that question to myself before. Uh, <laughs> I think, to a certain extent, it's sort of like trying to hold a handful of sand in your hand and being mad when a few grains slip out of the side. Yeah. Uh, from a content pro producer's perspective, I think you can still make money online if you go to where your customers are and engage them and provide them with a reason to want to buy your stuff, if only to support you and an easy way to do it. So you provide a product people want and a low friction way to buy it, then I think that'll work. But on the other hand, trying to ensure that your easily reproducible digital goods are never reproduced without your con consent is just not possible. Right. And I don't know if that problem will ever go away. Yeah, that's, a, that's probably true. Um, well, I, I, that's kind of all the questions that I had prepared, so I want to open it up to everybody in the audience to just talk, um, and uh, so if you guys have questions, go ahead and uh, shout them out, and, and we'll, we'll go around, and you, you can also say your own responses to any questions I asked, obviously, so if anybody's got anything, go for it. They're so impressed. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody wants to say anything. I'm so sad. No, this is just that. Uh, well, the one thing I already mentioned in chat is that all the DMCA. I mean, there was a big fuss about it. You know, uh, around 2000, this whole uh, DMCA bill was going to destroy the internet. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, it did, it did show a lot of abuse. There have been so many, uh, well, not entirely honest DMCA takedown request files and big mess. And that already shows that uh, something like Soka or Pika would never have any of the desired effect because it would just be abused due to just harass uh, to certain websites. And the thing, if you if you talk about um, well, what, what, what does the, uh, the the consumer want? What does the customer want? Well, what they want is is uh, something which is easy and cheap. It doesn't have to be free, because there are a lot of um, not so legal sites that have been taken down and let's keep popping up. This provides uh, easy downloads of movies and audio uh, for a cheap price. And they're so popular, so apparently people are willing to pay for it as long as it's convenient. Because I mean, uh, browsing down uh, all kinds of torrent sites is not convenient. It's a bit of a pain. But hey, it's free, so it compensates. But if it's cheap and easy, they will mm -hmm. just get it. And that's what pe well, that's what the... Uh, uh, that the content industry should be focusing on, providing that, and um, that then th there would be less of a problem. They would actually earn more money with less on enforcement and this kind of uh, crazy stuff, really. Yeah. That's the way I see it. No, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Did anybody else have any other thoughts on SOPA or I, Christian, go ahead. Well, I have an opinion on, on uh, 
Carl's question about the music, the RIA, the MPA. I think for the most part, the music, the music uh, pirating has been at least in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the new numbers, but I think they're going to be in a, in a huge decline because for the most part, the music industry is kind of getting, um, you know, with things like Spotify and Pandora and the iTunes Store and beyond the Amazon MP3 Store. I think now we can get all the music that we want without having to pirate. I know that I haven't downloaded in ages because there's not a need. Anytime I want to listen to a, to a song, I can just use one of those legal avenues to do so. Mm -hmm. well, I think the main problem is that the movie industry still doesn't get it. Um, yeah. With the draconian DRM standards. Um, and, and the fact that what I think is needed is a change in, in how we... Uh, how we view ownership of content. Uh, it used to be that when we bought a physical copy, we could lend that physical copy and transfer that, uh, that physical copy as many times as we wanted to, with no restrictions. And I think the concept of owning digital media uh, as far as, as movies kind of needs to be involved instead of owning maybe leaking the media. Yeah. The, the movie industry is going to have to, in order to alleviate the, the, the piracy, uh, they're going to have to uh, the, adopt more of the liberal music industries models that they have, after 20 years of being uh, drugged, you know, they, they have finally gotten it, that they need to make the stuff easy to get, or I'm just going to steal it. Right. I Now, I want to thank Daniel. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'd like to argue the fact that the uh, MPAA aren't the ones pushing it. It's actually the RIAA who's really still pushing it. The Movie Association, if you look at it, has historically kind of been okay with it, and to a degree, they really don't care about pirating in general. It's actually the RIAA who really pushes these things. In fact, the only one who's really pushed a statement about Pippa and Sopa being uh, shelved was the RIA. In fact, I'll read it real quick for you. The statement just shows how horrific uh, their mindset is. Uh, let, me, let me read this. Uh, we've been told repeatedly that the tech community agrees that something needs to be done. We take them at their word and continue to hope that we can sit down with responsible leaders from that community to devise a solution that will address counterfeiting and theft and, yes, bring the rule of law to the Internet. The MPA hasn't, MPAA hasn't even responded. They just kind of shrugged. The RIA, on the other hand, immediately turns around and issues this, which is just a horrific statement in and of itself. Uh, to be honest, to me and from what I know, the NBA just really couldn't care less. To the degree, uh, to use Could that sand less. analogy that was used, the amount of brain slipping out does not wholly affect them, and they could, they could care less. Because it's really tough to pirate the movies in a way uh, that they care about. Because what they really care about are people going into movie theaters and uh, uh, physically pirating a movie that hasn't been released. Because what they've discovered in the MKA uh, has pretty much said in some spots, piracy, in fact, has helped them sell the movies. Uh, people will pirate and then say, yeah, I want this. Mm -hmm. uh, where the RIA, on the other hand, just fly out attack everyone. For Lord's sakes, they've sued children and dead people. <laughs> <laughs> when they talk about abuse of power, it's the RIA here who's going to just just slam every little person that they can here for, I mean, for someone seeing something on YouTube, they would slam them. The NPA, on the other hand, if you acted out in a movie scene instead of uh, 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 doing something, they'd probably try and say, okay, well, more, more revenue for our movie eventually. Well, I, I, I'm not arguing about who's pushing it. I'm just saying who has the problem with content distribution at the moment. I, the NPA yeah, really... I, the IAA is trying to solve a problem that no longer exists with all the avenues that we have for, for... But see, they don't understand that it's been solved. It's because they don't see the money the same way. The reason why Mega Upload properly was taken down wasn't because of Mega Upload. It was the Mega Beats or whatever, Mega Music, whatever they're coming out with, in which the artists received 90% and Mega Beat, whatever the name for that was, only took 10%. And the record label mm. themselves were completely cut out. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that was about to be launched. So, oh, wait a minute. 
Suddenly yeah. Mega Upload and all their ventures are taken down. Oh, that seems really interesting. <laughs> that does seem convenient. Um, <laughs> it's like coincidence. Convenience that happens. I mean, here, I'll put my tinfoil hat on. Uh, I can wear it in the form of a stormtrooper helmet if you prefer. Right, right. And, and, <laughs> and uh, you're going to have to put that on at some point because I, I want to see it on. After my ranch here, I'll wear it for the rest of the time. <laughs> um, but... But here, clearly, what we're all saying is something that no one else keys in on. The issue here isn't that piracy occurs. Yes, piracy occurs, and we need to find a way. Open Act is a pretty good way to uh, uh, do something about it because it cuts off funding. Well, great. RIA and MPA uh, are more concerned about the little people. They want to be able to knock them off real quick. Uh, and, of course, we've seen that happen in YouTube, and we've discovered that they abuse it in YouTube. So... Uh, that all leads me to believe that, and they, they legally have a right to, because the way copyright law is written right now, if I uh, say the same speech as Martin Luther King, I am violating the copyright. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. I posted an article about that uh, a while ago. You need to pay, pay 10, uh, 10 bucks to actually watch uh, that speech. Yeah, it's 10, it's $10 just to speak it. So, hey, you know. Uh, same with singing Happy Birthday. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes, that's the thing. Happy birthday. So clearly what it is is our copyright laws in the United States are outdated. No way. Especially <laughs> compared to uh, technology. Uh, copyright laws weren't ever intended to deal with technology and sharing, and we've become a very open and sharing world. So cell phone pip-up need to be shelved until copyright itself is rewritten. Right. Well, exactly. I, yeah, yeah. I, and, and that's an entirely new debate that I don't know that we need to. Uh, Sorry, to 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 I mean, you're. I think I agree with you, but um, we'll try to keep this to uh, kind of the technology topics, just for for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so <laughs> let me. Let to Daniel, what's going to be? Uh, I had a question for Daniel, and uh, Daniel, what do you think of uh, Bitly's approach to getting around Twitter's uh, limits and? Uh, their new uh, analytics uh, engine that they just uh, announced this week uh, coming out of beta. Well, uh, I don't really know what Bitly's approach to getting around the limits might be, but I know that... Analyzing the links instead of the tweets itself. Oh, okay. Hmm. Huh. So... I didn't even know that. Are you saying that Bitly doesn't actually monitor... Oh, so... If people they're analyzing the usage of links through their own service, exactly. which happen to be on Twitter. Okay, exactly, well, and then later correlating the Twitter data together. Um, it's, I mean, it's a good idea. There's right now, if you go to any Bitly link, you can add a plus to the end of the URL, and you can see a graph of who's how many people have clicked on it, and when, and where. And then, obviously, on the back end, they've got scientists crunching that data to get any kind of information out of it they can. It's a neat way to add a complementary service to the the Twitter ecosystem without directly competing with them. I know Twitter yeah. has their own link shortener, and I'm not really sure if they strip out Bitly links and replace them with t.co links, but it's a good idea. Uh, currently, I mentioned, currently, Twitter will rip out anything and shorten it itself. So any of their official apps will deshorten it into whatever was originally sent there. Mm -hmm. What they're doing now, and they're rolling out ever so slowly, is everything sent into the Twitter sphere is going through their Earl, own Earl shortening service, which is then sent through basically the same concept of you know virus checking and content checking. It's it's kind of really nasty. They've really upset some of the developers. I know. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like uh, people who take Amazon referral links and strip out the referral URL and put their own in, so <laughs> they can steal your blog traffic and redirect it and make a penny off your readers. From, That's weird. Well, from, from what I read this week, uh, they can quite um, quite accurately predict uh, future sentiment depending on what time of day you actually tweet something. Right. So I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah but that sounds perfectly plausible. I know uh, Google has said that they can predict uh, flu outbreaks just by tracking mm -hmm. certain queries in certain areas. I've worked with a I've worked with a client with the CDC, uh, and we were looking at that through social media monitoring, where we were able to uh, help them track uh, health updates. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's pretty neat. And Facebook, I don't know if Facebook will outwardly claim it, but you can pretty regularly hear people asserting that Facebook can 
track their rise and fall of a relationship better than the people in the relationship can just by <laughs> wow. seeing you know, who you're talking to, whose pictures you're looking at, and what you do day to day. Wow, that's frightening. <laughs> that's that's crazy. I, I do know that they, you can now, uh, there are some softwares out there that will, you can predict the sex of the person and the age of the person just by reading the tweets. It'll, it'll, it can pretty accurately uh, tell you sex, age, and geographic location. Hmm. Wow. By, by, by the context of their words. <laughs> yeah. I, I would want to see that for, for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try that out. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> well, along those, those lines of big data, I'm curious to, because I've got a couple of Android developers and I've got Daniel here who works with big data. I'm curious to hear about um, what companies are saying, Daniel, uh, that they might be able to use Android devices or, or iPhone devices, any mobile device, to access this data, or at least pieces of it. Um, is, is that something that you ever comes up in your you know, business meetings, that you know, we want to go mobile with our data? Uh, That's pretty common. Uh, the data that I tend to work with is usually medium term. It's strategic data rather than tactical. It's not say, from a retail store, you could say, this particular store is running low on this product in the middle of the day, let's get them an emergency shipment. That's more tactical stuff. Mm -hmm. The strategic stuff is more, we're detecting a trend that this whole area is underperforming, we need to call the people in charge and work it out. So that type of strategic monitoring is usually done by analysts and executives. So if you've got middle managers and corporate executives who want this information, those are the very people who are least likely to be sitting at the same desk all day watching their web browser. So generating the reporting is a big problem in and of itself, or the data, but then getting them access to it on an airplane in a different office on their phone, I mean, that, that's pretty common. Yeah. And I found that the two big uh, BI stacks <coughs> I've worked with so far, they tend to default to the web browser as their uh, main client. And I think both of them have been slowly catching up in terms of offering mobile device access. I know with SAP, they've got their own native uh, Android and iOS apps, or at least I think they had as of last year. And they just sort of interface with the system. And as a developer, it's pretty easy to imagine if you design your new back end properly, you can have any number of clients that are all right. leveraging the same data. It's just I, was, I was wondering if there were any unique, I, I assume there's some unique challenges. I mean, is security ever, ever a big concern to companies with, when you're going mobile? That is definitely a big deal because... Uh, you get a split between the, the classic BlackBerry type device where a company will run BlackBerry service, I think they call it BlackBerry Enterprise Server. So imagine you've got all of your corporate workstations and your email server and everything else inside of a firewall and they're effectively trusting each other. With a BlackBerry, you put the BlackBerry Enterprise Server inside the firewall so then when somebody out in the field wants to check their mail, It'll send their, it'll connect to BlackBerry, which then connects to your BlackBerry Enterprise Server, which gets them safe access into the network. But now more and more people are bringing their own devices. Say so people prefer to have their own iPhone or their own Android device, and they don't really want a BlackBerry. And that problem is forcing companies to deal with the uh, the security access in a more robust manner. You can't just farm it off to BlackBerry where they give you one product that you can analyze and say, oh, this is fairly safe, so anything we send through that will get our, our work done. Once you step back and you say, all of our data systems need to be web services and all of our web services need to be accessible through the web, but only in a safe way to keep corporate data from leaking in ways you don't want, then that's just a whole new problem for people. And I think the most party of uh, applications like the one I mentioned from SAP are more likely to just follow the, the path tried by BlackBerry where they'll give you a way to get this one type of application out. But when it comes to dealing with all the other applications you made built in-house, you're on your own. Now, I suppose it's possible that major phone vendors will be able to handle VPNs into your network where people can just click into a single application that establishes a VPN connection to the office and then browse through that way. But I've not really seen that, Doug. Andrew or Maya, have you guys seen anything along those lines by chance or anything similar to that that you wanted to talk about? I don't know. If, yeah, I was just curious. Uh, well, they don't get everything, but <laughs> i got nothing really to add, I guess. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm, you don't have to. I was just curious if you guys had 
some some ladies there. All right. Well, anybody else have anything else good to uh, ask or bring up or talk about or put in? Nobody. David, you've been quiet. I haven't haven't heard. I have been quiet. That's right. I guess I was searching for a couple of things. One of them is um, TouchGraph, which is sort of database related. I was trying to figure out whether TouchGraph um, was sort of a social, you know, connection that you might be familiar with or want to talk about. And and it, it's old. Um, the first time I ran into it was the early days of Facebook, and they had some examples. They had three examples. One was connecting all of your friends in Facebook, and it was your your classic um, uh, graph where you can click on a person and see a little cloud floating around of all the people that you're friends with, and you and and maybe your college would show up or something. Then you could click on your college, and then all the people in Facebook that you were friends with at that college would circulate around. It was very visual. Mm -hmm. And then they did uh, Amazon was the other example where you could you do an author or something, and then you click see all the books that that particular author you know has has authored, and it was very visual. And at the time, I was interested in it because we were going through SOX compliance, and SOX compliance was you know trying to come up with uh, processes in the business, and the business um, had to have procedures tied to policies, tied to proof that you were doing every single thing that the procedure said that you were supposed to prove that you were doing, you know, that type of thing. Yep. Everything was kind of linked together in a way that it seemed like a touch graph would be really cool because you could say, well, show me the policy. Why the heck are we doing this policy? Well, the policy then would show all the different, you know, SOX rules and then it would say, well, you know, show me this procedure. You know, where are the documents? Related, so it was this really neat intergraph visual way that we could approach an audit or a question about a policy or the procedure itself, you know, and get yeah. drilled down to it. So, well, I imagine that's a that's a, an idea that would help a lot of companies. I know because I've worked at <coughs> oh, yeah, a dog a dog came here. <laughs> that was Kathy. Um, I, I worked with um, both GE and Siemens before at different times, and at Siemens especially, I was doing technical writing, and we had to keep really strict records on you know where these technical documents went in the process. Yeah. So we we had a lot of those problems too, where documents would get sit, sent to like three writers, and they'd come back with. You'd think a huge company like that would have that kind of thing figured out, but they don't. <laughs> they definitely didn't. And that's often the case. I mean, a lot of uh, those big companies, once you learn exactly how they do their uh, certain parts of their, well, technical write documentation, um, you're like, wow, how is the company in so many the same business? <laughs> Sometimes you don't. <laughs> they evolved. They evolved to be a big company, and by the time they figured out that they needed it, Slate, it was too yeah. late. Let's just start with this right away. So, Daniel, have you seen any of that uh, being at a relatively, I mean, Fred's isn't huge, but it's a big company. Um, you know, have you seen any of that, like, where you had to go back and fix big things that were done really poorly or designed really poorly at some point? That's a, a never-ending problem in yeah. development. Uh, anything that's over-specified, maybe you come up with new requirements that I mean, I guess I had a problem this morning where I designed a particular application after several discussions with the end user, and we discussed that we were tracking a particular type of event that takes two weeks, and my whole application is designed around these being two weeks, and my data retention policies go out to maybe two months, because I figured that would be enough of a uh, reading room, but now they've got some nine-month events, and I got some dirty looks in the meeting, like, why didn't I uh, just decide to store years worth of data just in case because everybody knows about nine month events. And, <laughs> I mean, that sort of thing it never ends and right. you got to keep a good attitude about it and make sure that people understand what decision you make and why and that as long as you, you know, keep a, a good attitude about it and work collaboratively with, peop collaboratively with people rather than taking an adversarial stance, it's, it's usually okay. Um, depending on the size of the organization, it's not really a big deal at Fred's, but in my last job, we had maybe 10 times as many people in IT, so product, uh, projects would spawn these vast reams of documentation, mostly online, but still you'd have a change control committee that would track every 
little facet of the large project, and whenever someone had a change that needed doing, then people would work up a, a prospectus on it, and they'd take it to the change control review board, and that would all generate documentation every step along the way. So yep. there's always documentation and justification for everything, but it doesn't necessarily validate it. Uh, just because someone's got it written down here that this is what we decided to do last year, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good idea anymore. Uh, right. You know, you know th th let me interject. This is that's the exact. It's always been my um, this assumption theory that I have. It, it's all it's, we always make compromises based on uh, things that we assumed at the time were truths. So we 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 want to do something, but we all in the room know that we could do it differently if this thing didn't wasn't in the company. And, and if we took that thing and put it in a box, we went ahead and do it the, the compromise way. We compromised a little bit, but then we'd get to the next problem and we realized that, that oh, we want to do it this way and, and, and know we have to compromise because of this thing over here. We take that one and put it in a box. And every month, you just grab the box and you say, does this thing still exist? Because if it doesn't exist anymore, let's do it the right way. But you know, it is what you're talking about. It's not necessarily you're doing these procedures and it not, not necessarily the right way, but you had to do it a certain way mm -hmm. at the time Yeah, because of something at the time. Well, I wanted to give uh, see if Greg had anything to say on this because, Greg, you worked with a company in Nashville what, last summer, right? Yeah. Um, I worked with HealthSpring over the summer. I was a security intern there. And uh, I'm sorry, I've been going in and out because I'm trying to track down a bug in some PHP code and listen to you guys you are. at the same of time. You are. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely um, talking about people wanting to bring their own events and stuff. That was an absolute nightmare because you had um, it was all the executives that wanted to bring their own stuff in. So you would, I mean, you'd have to let them bring their stuff in, um, and then they wouldn't want any restrictions on it. So they wouldn't want security installing their own software to help. Uh, to help control security and that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a, a big nightmare. But I don't know. All these devices are so locked down, there's not a ton of stuff you can really do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then people who are valuable enough to the company to just bring in their own, say bring in your own mat to get your work done, that, that can be a calculated decision. Maybe it costs you $2,000, but if it becomes your personal advantage that allows you to be secretly more productive than the rest of your team, you might get your $2,000 back pretty quickly. And that's <laughs> oh, yeah. the gamble yeah. you get from me. Well, I did that too. Um, it was a few summers ago I worked at Healthways, um, which they, f they fixed the security flaw, so I, I really don't care talking about it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> they, um, I was doing some SharePoint stuff for them, um, and they, 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 they um, it was a difference between, I had like two different kind of managers and one manager uh, wasn't too happy with me actually working on SharePoint stuff while the other manager wanted, that's all they wanted me to do. So um, I'm trying to do SharePoint and we're trying to do um, designing how uh, emails are going to come in. It was pretty much making a facilities form so you could fill out um, tickets. And then depending on what you, what topic your ticket was on, it would go to different people. So um, I was getting really, really sick and tired of trying to figure out how to do it without using SharePoint Designer. Mm -hmm. um, and the other manager who didn't want me using SharePoint at all refused to let me use SharePoint Designer. So I, being the clever intern I am, decided to bring in my own laptop with SharePoint Designer installed <laughs> and work on that. <laughs> And uh, some of these companies don't even make sure that um, it's an actual company asset that's connecting to their network. So I could plug my, my own laptop in and I actually showed uh, some of the security people I was using uh, Kane Enable and Wireshark and I was able to show, I was able to get anywhere I wanted in their network with my personal computer. They weren't checking at all if it was a company asset. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's kind of good because you pointed out a bug. But this brings up an interesting point when you have that, um, the... Uh, in a, almost inability to communicate between tech guys who understand computers and software very, very well and the guys at the top level who just say, I want things done this way and that way because it's policy or this and that. And, it, you know, it, you, I'm sure all you guys have come up against this at some point, but how do you deal with that kind of problem? Is there, have you run into any good solutions for that? I tend to work within the system 
within reason. Uh, there's some things I'll just do it my way without even looking at the policy. I mean, you always could say it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> so there's a lot of that. But then there's other cases uh, where you might decide that the restrictions in place are not really providing a healthy or engaging work environment for you. I mean, I've changed jobs before because I didn't really feel like I was fully engaged due to some organizational and cultural issues. I mean, they're nice people, it was a nice job, but if you feel like you can be engaged in a more wide open environment, then sometimes that's better. I mean, if you look at a, a 10 person web shop, there's going to be generally a lot less red tape and overhead, and people just get the jobs done. Yeah. On the flip side, if you wind up being incompetent or making a mistake, there's nowhere to hide. Everyone's going to know that you're the one who broke it within minutes, but people just have to make their decisions based on. I guess what, how how well, they, how well they trust their own competence and what their tolerance for risk is. Yeah, and I think Andrew uh, is is on a little rant in the chat bar because he left the uh, corporate world because of that kind of thing. So I, <laughs> I understand that. Well, and I want to know if any of Greg's employer uh, or staff people are watching the live hangout, and he just ratted himself out. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> 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 Maybe you should wave and apologize. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, well, it's uh, too late now. We'll just hope they don't use Google Plus because most, you know, <laughs> most people, they're probably still on Facebook. They're probably still on Facebook. So. Well, as a business owner, when when an employee wants to change a system or a process uh, and comes with suggestions, uh, if if I, if appropriate, I tend to give them a, uh, the larger picture. Right. And see if their their idea still holds. Mm -hmm. but sometimes when when you approach a, a department uh, to change a procedure or, or a process, uh, and you don't have the whole picture, then it doesn't make sense to you why 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 a process is a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, once somebody has the whole picture and they still have a, a, a suggestion where it can uh, affect efficiency or uh, or uh, cost, then then definitely you know those suggestions I think I take into a, into a, into advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's really hard to know. There's not a standard answer that says you know you can always do this or that. Always listen to the tech guy or always listen to the management guy. Um, but I think I think it's a case at least for management people to understand technology at least at a base level, even if they're not Correct. experts. And and I, I that's something that that I wish people stressed more in in college and and in job training too. But I think I think bringing up more more engineers and more technical guys up to management level should alleviate some of those problems. Because uh, when when you have a, a management that, uh, or the decision maker that has no technical knowledge whatsoever, then uh, they're only looking into the prism of cost, uh, cost benefit, and and always acting. All, all the decisions come from a reactionary place instead of a proactive place. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time you're going to get a middle management or a management that has no technical knowledge to invest in new technology or change processes is when they're hit. You know, yeah. when, when a data leak has uh, or, or a network breach has, has happened and, and, you know, they got bad PR, that's when things will be implemented. And usually it's just to appease that PR. But uh, bringing up and cultivating, and even uh, technical guys expressing more interest in management, which usually don't go hand in hand, you know. Uh, from 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 my experience, technical guys, you know, rather be behind the scene kind of guys. And, and if you wanna wanna take that step to become a managerial, because they, obviously they don't want to have the boring monotonous the job. They wanna be in the trenches as 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 fighters, you know, and. Uh, so, but uh, having those management skills and being able to actually intelligently uh, tell a middle management, upper management person why uh, we should invest or change the process, then uh, then you should have more uh, more be more effective with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's a common issue. I think that so many. Uh, I mean. A manager should not be just a manager. I think that's uh, what it uh, boils down to. And if you've got a, uh, got a CEO, CEO should not be just a CEO. Uh, they should actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, and that's I, Yeah, I've definitely <laughs> seen a lot of cases where the technical guys on the, you know, in, as you say, in the trenches, don't respect some of their managers because of the fact that they don't understand what they do even, you know, and it's like, yeah. I, I don't know if that's, 
uh, common at everywhere, but it's the places. I think I'm it depends. I mean, so some places are better than others. I mean, uh, well, I, I guess that's uh, the companies we which do not correct that kind of behavior uh, eventually die off. Usually, I mean. It, uh, there's a story from Microsoft. There was someone who worked there. He was writing about how you uh, does well. This was back in the late 90s, I believe. It all the, all these teams working on different parts of the of a project, totally disconnected. They had one manager, but they didn't communicate. It was an uh, entire mess. And well, it was around the time when uh, when Vista was being developed and Windows ME. So yeah, you can kind of imagine what yeah. So they changed after that. Because you need communication, you need to, to actually know what you're talking about, uh, the right decision has to be made, and it, I mean, the main uh, uh, characteristic of a good leader is that a good leader does never overrule those, those people um, he's supposed to lead. Mm -hmm. So a good manager actually listens to the people he is, well, trying to manage. Right. I mean, you know the tyrant, at least right. you shouldn't be. <laughs> I, I don't think you, you have to have a... Uh, a big knowledge in order to lead. What you should no, you don't. is trusted advisors and trust the, those advisors. It's surround yourself with exactly. people. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I could be completely, and I am completely literally about half the stuff you guys, you know, talk about within the first 45 minutes of <laughs> hangout. <laughs> but, but you know, if I, if I were running a large, you know, medium-sized enterprise, then then I would surround myself with people that do know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And trust that advice. Yeah. The problem comes in when you have leaders that do not trust their advisors and, and make, end up making decisions uh, ill-informed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so there's also well, I mean, there's this one running joke about uh, well, the, was his nephew coming in to do something, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a yeah. bad choice, bad decision. Usually ends up as a big disaster, and it actually happens. That's the worst part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does happen. So uh, I haven't, um, Kathy and Shane, you guys have been relatively quiet, so i got to get to you in the last few minutes here. Um, are, are there any, and we were talking earlier about big data and social data, and I know you guys are both kind of on the marketing side, and that's Shane's more PR maybe, but similar fields at least. Um, what, what do you guys see in big data gathering for clients you work with or people you've worked with um, or social data? What, what would be good for you guys? New tools. Yeah, new <laughs> tools, of course. <laughs> well, it's well, the, my frustration is that there were some good tools out there, or at least tools with good possibility. But with, um, for example, Twitter now has has lowered the number of um, tweets you can sift through at a given time. I think it's down to 150 or something. Um, you know, I I don't know the technical terms of it, but basically, you can't collect a lot of data if it's the data is not provided to you, so I'm having problems finding tools that I can use out there to get the data that is useful to customers. I don't know about anybody else. I don't have a big budget, so I can't pay for these big expensive things. That there's uh, a reason why you're seeing that, by the way, Kathy. Uh, and yeah, I know they want they want to charge for it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Facebook and Twitter are just running out, of, uh, and all social uh, media places are running out of uh, money. I mean, yeah. especially, uh, there's a reason why they've changed all their APIs and everything. It's because they've got to find a way to get more money. Uh, and so they'll milk it any way they can, and they'll take away every single tool you've got until pretty much all you're left with is the social users being able to use it. It'll take big bucks to be able to get anything out of it. That's my frustration. Yeah. Well, they... I mean, their value, you, you know, to be honest, the value of Facebook and Twitter is the data they have. Yeah. I, like, you can, I, I, I agree it would be nice from a developer standpoint to have full access to their, you know, un, unhindered API, but, it, it, you know, I understand they're a business, and they, neither one of them make much money, to be honest, compared to how much has been invested. So, I don't and, know. You know, Carl, you hit something really interesting there when you said that uh, they've got something really good there with the data. Hence Google Plus. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, and, and that's the interesting thing about Google. They're in the position with Google Plus, if they can get, you know, enough traction and people using it, that because they've got the, the money to support this without making revenue from it, they might just be in the position to be the developer's favorite. Uh, and now they're not yet. They're not at all yet. I hate that. They don't even have an API, a real one. <laughs> I know, I know. 
But but they they have that potential, right, Andrew? I mean, they don't have to make money off this like everybody else. Not the same way. They have a lot of potential because simply they don't care about uh, the money. They right. care about the data. Right. They want, they want people to start mining that data. But that said, the, the missing factor here is uh, where the heck is the API? <laughs> I think we'll see it once they um, once they feel comfortable enough uh, that the e ecosystem is, is developing. You know, the, uh, the the users, attraction, all the people. Usually, 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 driving? <laughs> oh. You should not hang out and drive. It is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's worse than texting and driving, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Maybe. So, um, I think uh, Carl has a point. Uh, Google doesn't have to make any money on Google Plus. Well, they already are. Search plus your world. That the whole strategy is, you know, Facebook uh, closed, uh, uh, cut the deal. Uh, Twitter shut down the fire hose. So uh, social, we all know that social, and and social is going to be the key for future search. Where the money is. And uh, we're going to start seeing more and more of that appear within the search results. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Is anybody familiar with Google Music to know, do they, act, do they make money off of those sales as well? I'm sorry? You, you yeah, they make money. I'm sorry, Andrew? They, str they struck a deal with uh, each label. They, Google does make a certain portion of money off that. Uh, I mean, at least in their music store, they do. Okay. Uh, as for the streaming locker, no, there's no money to be made there. Is someone playing with reindeer? <laughs> <laughs> I had to click the button. I didn't know. I've never seen it before. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, cool. that's, that's a better hat than mine. I like it. <laughs> trooper. Oh, I got to take cool. a out of Well, let me throw something new out here before the conversation totally wraps up. We're talking about using social media data for the benefit of business. One of the areas that I'm trying to expand in that I found really helpful is to look at some of these forums like Quora and LinkedIn and some of the other places and use those as focus groups that rather than uh, pulling in focus groups and forming focus groups that cost a lot of money and then trying to get people to talk about something that at that moment might not be their passion. If you can jump into conversations um, using existing conversations that have been started, <clears throat> it's a great place to use that as, as a focus group. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't think Quora, does, does Quora have an API? They're still in like beta, so I doubt they do. Never yeah, everything is in beta or alpha. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which I don't know why they are. They work. It works. I mean, mm. call it call it a release. I guess. Uh, whatever. <laughs> well, Kathy, have you um, uh, have you tried to use uh, the Google Docs survey uh, tool? To I have Google not. Server? No, that, that's no. A, that's a is for what you do, uh, and and kind of maybe not. Uh, focus groups. So if you you had a set of of, uh, uh, of people that you could poll uh, to get the answers that you were looking for, it's a light, inexpensive way for you to to do so. Creating your own service with the Google Docs and sharing those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Google Docs is relatively new to me, so I'm still learning all the different things you can do with it. I've been using Survey Monkey and um, Survey Gizmo. Okay. Yeah, I feel so. I feel so old-fashioned at the moment because I don't use Google Docs, I don't use anything Google except, uh, I mean, I even use the, the IMAP interface of uh, Gmail because I don't like using the webmail interface. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use anything of that, I mean, I feel so completely, like, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably younger than most of you guys here, so, <laughs> wow. Yeah, hey, well, well, I'm you. Supposed to be hip and with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I'm a bit conservative, I guess. I mean, it's, it's all like, well, yeah. I mean, I, I get a point of some things of that, but on the other hand, I'm like, well, I mean, I like my old-fashioned forums and old-fashioned blogs. I mean, I remember when blogs were modern. <sighs> they were the new thing. They were. They were new not long ago. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was only like ten years ago, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome back into mainframe computing. Right. 
Oh, I oh, love well, mainframes. So. Guys, I, I have to get off here, but y'all are well. I think you can. Well, I'm, it, it may end, actually. No, it won't. No, it's fine. It's no, fine. Won't, okay. won't end. Okay, so. It'll never end. It so you're, you are all welcome to stay, but I am go, I've got to do some more, send out some emails and do some work tonight. So. Yeah. Real work. Real work. Well, yeah. Your time. I know. Uh, I have to leave, too, so. But, uh, but I was going to at first thank Daniel for um, his time. Thank you very much, yeah. Daniel, for coming on. Hey, and, thank you. Yeah, and. You know, obviously, we'll be in touch online, and if you guys ever um, think of someone you, you want to recommend to be a guest, just send them my way. Uh, I think next week I have um, a guy who works in IT, and I don't remember where, but um, he's going to be talking about some... Uh, He'll work in IT. <laughs> well, right, but uh, I guess he works with the physical connections of IT, not all, all the programming. So this well, is I work the other side thing. of things. <laughs> Um, like more interesting. Well, it's, it's a different perspective. So yeah. anyway, we're going to be talking about uh, connecting more houses to the internet, especially with the, cool. with the new bill recently that um, is going through. I think that's going to allow low-cost internet for low-income areas. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, anyway, so I will give you guys the notes as always. But thanks for joining me and have a good weekend. Yeah. You too. You too.